Good morning, good morning, Rabotai. Breakfast in the class today is dedicated in thanks to the esteemed rabbis and their staff for taking care of us with their wisdom, guidance, and patience. May they go from strength to strength in keeping our Jewish values and faith strong and unwavering. Sponsored by the Mafar family. Mafar family. Hazaku Baruch. Uh, as well, breakfast in class is sponsored by um, Farida and Adam Akrak in honor of the birth of their baby girl, Mazal Tov Mabruk. Okay, Rabotai, um, we are sitting in the middle of the throes of one of the most beautiful holidays. And in this holiday, we read uh, about in the Adan Isim, Valatvokan, Valgivorot, right? In the days of Matitya, Ben Yochanan Kohen Gadol Kisham, the Machut Yavan Reshah, when the evil kingdom of, uh, of the Assyrian Greeks stood up against the Jewish people, they, they, their stated purpose was to be able to eliminate and eradicate the, uh, the uh, Jewish ideology of Torah and mitzvot. Now, I always thought this was so interesting because I, I still remember this idea. You know, when I was living in London, I remember once there was a bus driving by and there was an advertisement for atheism. And, and for atheism. And I still remember, I commented, I'm walking with this person in the street, and I said, it's so interesting. Could you imagine spending money on nothing? To spread the knowledge of nothing. To convince people of nothing. It's such an interesting dynamic, if you think about it. Now, here we are. You have the Greek people. They want to convince, they want to force the Jews. What do they want to force the Jews to do? One would imagine that the, that the tefillah would be, not but rather that they were trying to teach them Greek culture. That's what it should say. They were trying to teach them another culture. Then it's at least about something. You're trying to communicate what you think, your wisdom. But it's almost as if the Greeks, they didn't actually even care if they became Greek. So long as they were not Jewish, that was enough. What a weird thing to say. Isn't that strange? So in order to understand this, we kind of have to, I think, maybe delve a little bit into what it is um, that we are supposed to be learning from Chanukah from this holiday. Our rabbis tell us that the, the halakha, it's a very strange halakha. The halakha says, Kaveta eno zakuk la. If the lights of Hanukkah go out, eno zakuk la. You don't need it. What does that mean? How, how does that translate? You know, we're all aware about the fact that the lights of Shabbat, the nerot of Shabbat, are there to increase shalom bay in the home. Okay? So if the, everything is lit up, you see the beautiful meal, the magnificent table. You see your beautiful wife and children, your husband around the Shabbat table, increases Shalom Bay. I always said some people for Shalom Bay, they should not have candles. But either way, the point is, I'm not making any comments about your family, your wife, your cooking, uh, you know, I'm just saying, right? The halakha is, it brings Shalom Bay to the home. Could you imagine if you lit Shabbat candles and then the Shabbat candles went out? There would be no, no Shalom Bay, correct? So in a scenario where one could like that again, you would ostensibly want to have those candles lit. The purpose is for them to be lit, correct? The same thing one would imagine for the Nerot Chanukah. You light the candles of Chanukah, one second after you lit them, they're burning. A wind come blows them out. You think you have to light them again, correct? Halakha says you don't have to. Why? Because Hadlaka Ose Mitzvah. The lighting is what does the mitzvah. So if you lit the candles, no problem, that's it, chalas. Now, I always found that this halakha is very strange when you take it in connection and in uh, confluence with another halakha. The second halakha with regards to Chanukah is that a person needs to light an amount of oil that's capable of burning for half hour. What happens if they light a bit of oil and all there is in the oil is enough to burn for seven minutes? They you say the mitzvah or not? No. One more time. So if it burns seven minutes, I was not you say the mitzvah. If it burns for one second, I was you say the mitzvah. If there was enough oil for thirty minutes, is everyone seeing contradiction here? How could that be? 
It's not about kavana. It's about how much oil there was. What you need to have is that you did a lighting that could have been kosher. What happened after you attempted to make that light burn is not up to you. Whether the wind puts it out, or someone knocked over the menorah, or someone came and sprayed water all over it because they're anti-Semites and they wanted to put out your menorah, that doesn't matter. You don't have to light it again, you did the mitzvah. Rabotai, we're seeing here something unbelievable. That the commandment, if you will, of lighting Nero Chanukah is to make your best effort. That's the mitzvah. But not to make your best effort on a half-hearted mitzvah, to make your best effort on a kosher mitzvah. And if that kosher effort doesn't work, you raise up your hands and you say to Borei Olam, I tried, I did my best. Therefore we go through, in al Nisim, we say, who were they? Rishaim biyad, you know, Rishaim biyad tzadikim, Zedim biyad osketo atecha, Rabim biyad mehatim, Giborim biyad chalashim. We point out each and every part of the dynamic in which this mission was an impossible mission to set out upon. So in effect, the greatest miracle that we're looking at when we look at the story of Chanukah is that the Malchut Chashmonai, these people, the Maccabim, the biggest mitzvah, the biggest miracle, the biggest wonder of Chanukah is that they started the rebellion. The fact that the rebellion actually was completed, HaKadosh Baruch Hu took that into his own hands. And for God, a million soldiers, a billion soldiers is irrelevant. Like we saw what happened with Sanherev, they're surrounding all the city of Jerusalem. Hashem sends the Malach, bam, he wakes up in the morning and they're dead. Are, are we clear on this? So if that's the concept of Chanukah, this idea is something which is relevant for each and every one of us as well. And I think that's why the, the tefillah goes through each of these dynamics. Sometimes a person's in a situation where they feel weak, le'umat, something that is strong. You're sitting in your room, you have a terrible yetzer hara to do something that's incorrect. You feel weak in the hands of a yetzer hara who's a gibor. The, the, the celebration of Chanukah teaches you that the chalash can overcome the gibor. You're sitting in a place, in a situation in life where you're sitting against people that are so wicked, they're so evil. You wonder, will there be ever, will there be a chance at all for me to overcome them? The rishut, the way that they are, they're so, uh, they're so callous, they're so mean, they're so vindictive. I can never change someone like this. Remember that there's a possibility of, of rishaim biyad tzadikim. You understand? Each one of these elements, sometimes a person feels, I'm, there's so few of us over here. We're trying to get a minyan started. We're trying to start a learning program. But you know what? It's, it's us three guys against the world. Everyone out there has all these different things going on. Rabim biyad me'atim. The many are delivered in the hands of the few. Understand that your responsibility, your job, your, uh, your, your chiyuv is only to make your best effort to attempt to do a perfect lighting. And after that, HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes it in his hands and you don't know what will be. My favorite example for this, I'm going to give you one of them which is in, uh, in not so recent history and one of them which is in recent history. One simple example, Rabotai, of this is Rabbi Meir Shapiro. Rabbi Meir Shapiro started an idea called Dafyomi. Now, in truth, the idea itself is not so revolutionary, if you think about it. What did he do? He said, let's all learn together one page. How many pages are we going to learn a day? I don't know. Let's do one. <laughs> right? Let's make a calendar where everyone will do the same one every day. So wherever you are, this is the day, the Mishnah, the, sorry, the Gemara, the page that we're learning today. Right now, they're in Pesmasech and Pesachim. If, you know, everyone will do this this day. Now, again, is there something radical about the idea? Like, are they giving you prizes? Like, do you get entered into a raffle to go to the Barbados? All he said was, let's learn one page a day. But, but Rabotai, we all saw the scenes are still fresh in our mind of being in a stadium with 100,000 people. Started with so few. Rabim biyad me'atim. The Yetzirah is so strong against taking on a commitment. Normally, if it was me or you, what would we say? Let's do one Masechet together. 
The Jewish people today, what do we do? We're like, everyone get together at 12 o'clock. We're going to say one shir la ma'alot. Like that's what we aspire to. That we could say one little bit of tehillim for three minutes together. Ramesh Shapiro says, no, what are you talking about? I want something that's going to have a shi'ur that's going to last. Like the 30 minutes of oil that's going to last until the end of the zaman that it's supposed to be lit. So how long? We're going to do all of Shas. We're just going to break it up into something which is doable each and every day. And a man's dream from so long ago plays out in the real world to a level, to a place, Rabbi where you and I, this is now the fabric of our society. Now it's normal. It's, it's not me'atim anymore. It's not even, someone tells you they do the daf, uh, uh, 50 years ago, 80 years ago, you're like, wow! You learn the daf every day, rain or shine, on days, off days, no such thing, Xmas, Thanksgiving, Sukkot, you know, every single, Yom Kippur, you do a daf, unbelievable! Back then, now, every Tom, Dick, Harry, David, Jeffrey, Shalomo, Moshe Rabbeinu, every guy that you meet is doing daf yomi. What was once me'atim traversed that barrier and became a, a rabim. That is the power, Rabotai, of a person who makes the attempt to change the norm. I remember once I took a group of students to Poland and we, uh, we went to visit the Auschwitz death camp. And it was a very difficult uh, trip that time. And we had many students, everyone was crying. I mean, and it was terrible and it happened to be the day that we were there and the snow was coming down in blankets and it was freezing cold and there was a lot of wind, it happened to be Rabotai, the first night of Hanukkah. So we decided we were going to light the first night of Hanukkah with the group at the gates of Auschwitz. We took the one candle, we put it down, we tried to light it, it went out. Tried to light it, went out. But it didn't light. It, was, it didn't even catch. The wind was so strong that we couldn't get it to light. And people in the group started crying. Because I'm sure the symbolism isn't lost on you about a Jewish people, a group of young people trying to light some sort of light, trying to show that it was possible to recover and to move on and to go on from a place like that. And it just won't light. Until finally, all the students were great. They were kind of grasped by the, the gravity of the moment. And I can't tell you, I'll never forget this as long as I live. A bunch of students got on their hands and knees and they started digging a hole in the snow. Digging, 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 until the hole had walls. And then we got everyone to gather around to block the wind. We dropped the candle at the bottom of this little ditch that they had built. I leaned in, I lit the candle, we made the berachot, and right there, in the bottom of this ditch, we were able to experience the light of Hanukkah in the darkest place the world has ever seen. We sat there and we sang Ma'oz Tzur, we sang Tov Le'odot La'ashem, and a group of young Jewish men and women, for the first time in their life, many of them, with complete disconnection to Judaism and religion, felt the spark of Torah, of Yahadut, ignited in their midst. Rabotai, we were only able to do that because a group of Jews banded together. Because without that, the wind, the Ruach Mitsuya, right, was, was never allow the candle to, to, to grab hold. So when everyone came together and we had made ourselves a little bit of a Rabin, when we dug a hole and we were mi'afsher, we allowed for something to work. In those moments, suddenly something came forward. Rabotai, every person during the holiday of Hanukkah has to ask themselves this question. I'm lighting a candle to be able to show the world pirsumeh nisa. We're not lighting a candle because it's some stupid commemor commemorative thing. Judaism does not believe in commemorations. We don't have ceremonies for the sake of having ceremonies. We have ceremonies commemorating the past only for the sake of a different future. If it will change the way we live tomorrow, then we talk about yesterday. If it will not change our tomorrow, we don't need to talk about it. 
Is this clear? You don't celebrate Pesach because something happened once, but rather, like Rambam writes, Chayav Adam leharod et atzmo ki ilu hu, as if he himself is leaving Egypt. So I feel the cherut, I feel the responsibility to give thanks to God, I feel the responsibility to treat a person who has no money, or who has no background, or who has no yichus, v'zacharta, and you should remember, ki eved aita, ki ger aita, be'eretz misraim. We remember those days so that we can have new days in the future. So the question you have to ask yourself is, when I'm lighting a candle commemorating something that they did once that felt impossible, what's my impossible? What in my life am I not willing to try because I think I will fail? Get the people around you. Get your family bought in. Get a couple of friends. Lean down, dig a ditch. Give it its best chance of starting so that it won't blow out. You want to start a chaburah of guys learning? Find a place where it's COVID friendly so people are not scared to come. Bring great food so people have a great excuse to tell the Yetzirah why they're coming. I always said that. It says in Paga Becha Menuval, if a person has Yetzirah, Mashcheu Lebet Hamidrash, drag him to the Ben Drash. What does that mean? You think you're dragging him in chains? Of course not. It means take him to a lunch and learn. So when you check in, you tell the Yetzirah, I think that table's for you. And how that goes, he gorges out on the chicken. And where are you? You're in the Bet Midrash. Moshcheu the Bet Midrash. Drag him. Tempt him. Bring him in. You want to have a nice Hanukkah party? Get the best donuts. Thursday night Mishmar, have a chalent cook-off. Give yourself your best chance of survival. And then turn to Borei Olam and say what the Kohanim say as they finish the Beracha. We have done what you commanded us to. Asinu ma. We have done mashmutal alenu. What is incumbent upon us? And now you too, bless your people. Give them what uh, you promised to give them. You know, I always imagine there's a a famous thing that goes on now. It's called charity. You guys familiar with charity? Yeah. Charity is something that every organization will hassle you about. Right? Give money today, and we're going to double it, we're going to triple it, we have donors for quadruple it, we have other... So if you give a dollar, how many do we get? We get four. Right? Everyone calls it charity, I call it Jewish accounting. Either way, point is, right? So you have, you have what's it called? You have, you have this idea, this, this concept, you put in a dollar for... And I thought to myself, wow, what a beautiful thing they came up with. This idea, charity, to collect money for tzedakah. And then I realized, actually... This idea wasn't thought of by charity. It was thought of by God himself. God himself is the original matching donor. Whereas the Gemara says, In the way that you want to go, Shamayim drags you, they pull you, they open up the way for you. But it's on you. What do you have to decide? If in the way that you want to go, heaven leads you, and by the way, that works both hen latav, hen lamutav. It can go either way. So what is incumbent upon you if heaven will lead you? Just to choose a direction. Rabotai, that's the question. That is the question that each and every one of us face. And I'll end with this. You know, our rabbis tell us in many different important moments in history, moments where great rishaim, Terrible people decided in one moment, right before the end of their lives, that they deeply regretted the life that they lived. They did unbelievable, complete reversal to Shuvah in the last moments of their life. One example is Gemara, Abu Dazara, page 7, where the Gemara talks about Rabbi Elazar ben Durdaya. Another example talks about the Roman soldier, the executioner, who stood next to Rabbi Hanina ben Teradion, and he watched him suffering with the uh, zmorot, the, the sponge, the wet, the wet sponge that they put on his heart so that he would survive longer in the fire. And he says, if I take the cotton wool off, if I let you die faster with less pain, will you guarantee me a place in Gan Eden? Rabbi Khalina Mitra says, yes. 
and the man jumps in the fire with him. And in each time we see that Rabbi Yehuda said, Bacha Rabbi Ve'amar, Rabbi cried and he said, Yesh kone olamo b'sha'ah There are those that acquire their world in one hour. The question is, why is Rebbe crying about that? And I, I want to share with you one simple answer. The word sha'a means rabotai, it means one hour. But we also find the word sha'a in a very different context. In the beginning in Bereshit, when we talk about Cain and Hevel, right? The Pasuk also uses that word. Ve'el Cain ve'el minchato lo sha'a. That doesn't mean God did an hour. It means God did not turn. Said Rebbe, Bacha Rebbe ve'amar, Yesh kone olamo, some people acquire an entire world b'sha'ah echad, with one turn. Because the minute you've turned, especially in such a powerful, dramatic way, b'derech she'adam rotze lelech, olechim oto, so the decision is yours. The planning, the logistics is yours. But whether or not it will work, that's up to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So as the, fa the famous saying goes, you know, don't read the word impossible. Read it, I'm possible. If you look at that same word we witness in things that are Rabim biyad me'atim, Rishaim biyad tzadikim, Zedim biyad oske toratecha. Hanukkah teaches us that if a person makes their very best effort with a, a pure heart, then Bore Olam can make anything happen. May we be zoche to achieve those things that we thought were previously impossible. Baruch Adonai Le Olam. Amen. Amen.